Okay. Hello, everyone. Right now we're on mod two of the Optimizing Digital Learning course. And this um, module um, covers a lot of information. So we're going to talk about designing for equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And we're also going to look at universal design as well. Um, a lot of people, if we keep, just keep looking at what we need to do for accessibility, we might be missing some aspects that would help um, all of our students and not just students that um, need um, accommodations and things like that. So those are the big things that we're going to be talking about this week. Okay. Now, um, one of the things I did a presentation for um, ITC, the Instructional Technology Council, back in 2020. And I have to laugh because it was in February, it was around the same time. And they shut the country down right after, within days after I got off the plane coming back from this conference in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. So um, one of the big things is, um, and I, you know, now they kind of renamed it as equity and inclusion, is to remove any barriers that we have for our students in our courses. And um, one of the big barriers that they're looking at is the first day complete and giving students access on the first day of for every single course for fall. So um, that's gonna be a big barrier that we're gonna eliminate for our students, okay? So we're gonna talk about some of those things. Um, we're gonna talk about um, some of the standards that are part of OSCAR that meet um, for our compliance issues. And um, Back in 2014, Lisa Limbroshu and I took um, training on accessibility and how to make our course materials um, ADA compliant. So um, I'm going to talk about the Ally Gear to show you where to find that and how to use the resources from that to um, assess your documents to see what needs to be updated. So we're going to take a look at that. Um, to make sure that all your um, what you're bringing into your course, I, I have to laugh because I was talking to a few people that were teaching face to face classes and they're like, well, if I don't have a student that needs closed caption that's required, why do I have to have closed captions in my face to face classes? And um, that can actually help with any students. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the key takeaways as to um, hopefully what you're going to get out of this uh, module. And in, in this module, we're going to talk about the wording in your syllabus and um, how to make it more inclusive. And um, I'm going to show you an example of a um, email that I just sent out to my students. And as I was preparing for today, I went back and I looked at it and I'm like, well, I could have reworded this a little bit more on, you know, not use the word require, you know, some of the things, some of the wording that I use that I could have, you know, made some changes. So um, I'm going to show you some of the resources and then I'll show you some more things that I can work on myself and everybody can work on um, as they build their syllabus. And um, one of the, the resources we're going to look at today is the um, Caring for Students playbook. And it has some really neat ideas. And I'm going to show you the playbook. And I, I did pull up a, um, a quote by one of the students and I found it very interesting and and it's something that I have heard from a, some of our students in the past as well so we'll talk about that all right all right so in Oscar there are many standards that talk about um accessibility and um in the design and layout and this is something we you know we even learned out something brand new about Brightspace that um, we're looking at when we're using the Oscar rubric to go in and, and look at your courses after they've been created. And one of the big things is, you know, is it consistent? Is it, um, you know, do you have modules? In each one of your modules, do you have a set of um, an overview, letting them know what they're going to be doing in the module, explaining to them, um, explaining why. A lot of students are like, well, why am I learning this? You know, they're telling me I need to know this, but they're not saying why, okay? So something like that would be in the diversity and inclusion part of it, okay? Um, do I have, um, you know, basically the same layout in each one of my modules? So that will help. Some of the things like they talk about using sans serif text 
um, not to use anything blinking. Obviously, blinking can cause issues with somebody who um, has epilepsy, and it can cause seizures if they have something that's blinking. Um, sans serif fonts and font sizes. This is something that um, isn't as prevalent now in um, all of our uh, materials that are online because the students can adjust their screens and zoom in on things and make it bigger. So yes, the font should be readable for everybody, but it's not quite as important. It's more important if you have handouts that you're handing in to your students in the classroom. They should be no smaller than size 12. And um, you know, even if we were doing an example of a research paper, I go in and change the footnotes all to size 12 because a lot of them are like eight or nine and that's not ADA compliant. And I have a hard enough time looking at text that's at least 12 or higher. Um, and I can't read it anymore without my glasses. So sometimes I'll zoom in on my, my screens to make it a little bit bigger. But um, if, you know, especially if you're doing handouts, you want to make sure that that's the case. Um, don't use tables as, as minimal as possible. Tables have to have a lot of um, alt text. They have to have a description for the table. And the first row has to set up be set up as a heading. And if you don't do all these things, it makes the table so it's not ADA compliant. So a screen reader would have a problem reading it. A lot of times people will use um, tables to actually block out text and you really should not do that. It should only be used if you have headings across the top to describe what's gonna be in each one of the columns. So if you're just doing it so you can have an image on one side and text on the other, um, you should not be using a table to lay that out. Okay, um, and that talks about some of the table options in there. If you're using PowerPoints in your course, this is something that if you are using um, content from a publisher, a lot of the publisher's PowerPoints um, needed a lot of work. Um, I've actually worked with um, Pearson and a couple of other publishing companies. And, you know, when we first were working on this back in 2014, you know, I kept explaining to them that if you don't make these changes, then um, somebody who's using these resources are not going to be able to continue using the publisher content. Um, one of the big things is if you ever look at PowerPoint, they have different layouts of slides where like one lay layout will have a title at the top and then it will have a section in the middle, um, a text box that can be used for graphics. It can be used for text, bulleted text. Um, it could be used for a chart, things like that. And a lot of people, we get very creative and we add, you know, images and we add boxes to put text off to the side and we start adding these pieces. And you really should not be doing that on a PowerPoint. You should only use the layouts that are available and basically plug your information into those layouts. And the reason why is because this way each slide will have a title. Each title has to be unique. So if you have something that's like if I had design and layout and then I had another screen that had design and layout that was slides, I would have to say like um, design and layout continued on the second one. So it would be able to be distinguished between in the screen readers, which one is the main slide, which is the one that the second one that goes with it. So um, things like that are very important, especially if you have a student that's using a screen reader. Okay. Um, Transitions on slideshows should not be automatic. The students should have to click to advance, especially if there's narration along with it. That way they can rerun the narration if they need to go back and review and it's not automatically jumping to the next slide on them, okay? Um, on, this, on the content and activities, this is something that um, has come to our attention that um, you really should be offering, like if you have a syllabus, Usually your syllabus is written in a Word file. And um, we have worked with screen readers that work well with Word files, but other ones work better with PDF files. Um, the disadvantage of having just a Word file is because they would have to need um, Microsoft Word to be able to open the file. So if you offer them both without them having to go in and do alternate formats for the text, then it will automatically, they can look at it and say, oh, you know, I would prefer to do a PDF because I'm on my phone and my phone can read a PDF, but I can't open a Word file. So basically any documents that you have in your course should be offered in two formats. 
If it's a Word file, it should be offered in Word and PDF. If it's a PowerPoint, you should offer it in as PowerPoint and as a PDF. And again, the PDF will help all the students if they're on the phone and they just need to look at the slides. Um, if it's an active slideshow, then obviously they're going to need PowerPoint. If you have something like that in your course, you should tell your students about Office 365 so they can get it downloaded on their computers or their devices. So when they do need to run those PowerPoints, they have access to it. And again, that would be more of a barrier issue, not so much a issue for ADA compliance or be more for like universal design. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind that if, I mean, it's so simple for us to save a file and then go on and do a save as a PDF and give them, excuse me, both those files. Okay, so anytime like your syllabus, your schedule, think about it as in the first days of your course, if you only gave them a Word file and they don't have Word on their computer, you've already set a barrier immediately for them. But if you've given them Word and a PDF, they should be able to open those documents up no matter what device they're using, no matter what software they have on their computers, okay? Most of them have the ability to open a PDF right away, okay? Um, any of your images, your shapes, um, anything like that should have alt tags. Alt tags should also be on hyperlinks and on tables. And if you had a table where basically you expect them to look at the table and be able to understand the table. Think about a student that can't see it and a screen reader is reading it to them. Um, you should have an alt tag to go with that table to let them know um, what the table is telling them. Yes, Catherine. What is an alt tag? I don't know what that is. Um, I will show you how to set that up. Basically what it is, is if you have a, um, like a hyperlink has alt text with it and it will, what it does is it takes the alt text and it describes to them what will happen if they click on that hyperlink. Okay. With a table, it's kind of text in the background that only a screen reader would read to them to tell them what that was all about. The same thing for an image. Now, if you describe whatever it is at the bottom, whether it be a table or you can actually put in the alt text description in the paragraph below image. So this way you would not have to put all that in as, you know, as part of the alt text. If it's a decorative image, then you could just say it's decorative so that they know that, oh, it's not relevant to what I'm learning. It's just there just to make it more eye pleasing. So those are some of the things you want to be careful of. Um, hyperlinks should be the text that you're actually linking out to. So for an example, um, if I was going to link out to the college website, I wouldn't put the text in there as http colon slash slash niagaracc.suny.edu. What I would do is type in the text, Niagara County Community College website, select that and make that the hyperlink, okay? Um, you never wanna use click here as the hyperlink either. And the reason why is that if a screen reader is reading a document, what it will do is it sets up a table of all the hyperlinks on the website or on the page that they're reading. And if you think about it, if you say like Niagara County Community College and then the click here after it is the actual hyperlink, all your hyperlinks will be labeled click here, click here, click here, and it doesn't tell them where it's taking them to. So that's why you want to be very descriptive of your URLs. And you're going to see, I'll even point one out where it will be good, and then this is a bad one. So actually, for an example on the next screen here, these are good hyperlinks. So they're actually telling you where you would go if you clicked on that link. Okay, so I think on the next one, let me go down. Like this here is really not a good hyperlink. Okay, it would be better off saying, you know, um, online learning um, accessibility page, that kind of thing. So actually, this would not be ADA compliant. Okay, and the, the reason why is for one, that list that it creates when it lists out all the hyperlinks on a page for a screen reader. 
is for that. And when this would get to this, it would actually have to spell out this whole URL. And would that even mean anything to the student as it's reading it to them? It probably would not. Okay, so um, so it's very important to make sure that your hyperlinks actually say this is where you're going to go. This is what it's going to open when it when they click on that link to jump to it. Okay, we forever we kept using click here. So again, a screen reader if all of them are click here is after the text we're telling them where it's going to them. The screen reader would just be a whole list of click tiers and it wouldn't tell them where to go or what it would send them to if they clicked on it. Okay. So, um, okay. So one of the big things is we are required by law through the college to make sure that our content is accessible, whether it's in the classroom, in an online environment, all of our documents that we load, all of our websites, all of our classrooms, all of our bathrooms, everything has to be compliant. So it's not just looking at the content that we have in our courses. So our department looks and helps you guide you through this for doing your content that you're going to be putting in your courses. Okay. But we actually have an entire group on our campus that um, is our EIT group. And we actually are working as a group to try and make our entire campus ADA compliant. And I'm on the group from my department for um, course content. But like Wayne Lynch is looking at um, the, um, the facilities, okay? Do we have enough doors that have a, a push button to access our buildings? Do we have elevators to give access to each one of our second stories? So he would be looking at that um, our, um, our person, Ryan, um, oh, I can't think of Ryan's last name, Ryan, um, who does our websites, he has to go through all the websites to make sure that they're ADA compliant. Okay. And anytime we put anything up there, he has, he runs a check on them. So there's a whole team of us on our campus that are working together to try and make sure that we are in compliance. But, um, one of the things, and I really like this image here. Let me see if I can blow it up so you can, not that will let me get it bigger. Oh, I won't. Okay, well, this one here, it's showing a person shoveling the stairs and there's a, um, a person sitting at the bottom of the wheelchair ramp um, who's waiting for them to shovel that. And the guy's telling him, well, once I shovel the stairs, then I'll shovel the ramp. And the person in the wheelchair brings up the topic that if you shovel the ramp first, everybody can go in. And it's not restricting from anybody. So that's where universal design started to come into play. Okay. We're not just looking at standards that are just for accessibility, it's for everybody. And, um, you know, back to somebody saying, well, I put videos in my course, but I know that I don't have any students that are hearing impaired. So I don't have to worry about closed caption. Well, that's not true. Okay, we have to have everything closed caption, just like I turned on closed caption before we started today. So you had the choice if you didn't want to see it, you could turn it off, but it's there. Okay, um, we've had another, we actually have a professor that um, reads lips. So we had to make sure that the video was on us. We were showing our camera so that when we were talking, she could see what we were saying. Okay. Plus, obviously, she could read the closed captions. So we got to think about that. Plus, if you think about it, if you have a video in your course and your student is at the gym and they're on the treadmill or riding the bike or whatever, and they have their phone in their hand and they can say, well, I've got a, a five minute video that I have to watch for my course. Um, can I do it now? Because, but I forgot my headphones. So now I can't listen to it. But if it's closed caption, I can watch the video and read the closed captions as I'm going through. Or if I'm on a bus and the bus requires, you have to have headphones. Any public transportation, you have to have headphones. So right there, by having closed caption on the videos, you're eliminating that barrier that will prevent them from being able to watch that wherever they are, whenever they are, okay? So that's another thing to, you know, to think about, okay? Um, now, before we get into 
the incorporating diversity, and I, I kind of jumped over and I had that list on my thing to do, and it was the one thing I forgot to do. I have a poll that I wanted to do with you today, and I wanted to see where you were, and I kind of already gave you some of the answers to some of the questions, but let's see how well you were listening as, as I was talking. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to launch the poll, and I want you to fill it out, and um, and then once everybody says they're done, I will... Um, Go ahead. Can you see the poll on your screen? Catherine, just shake your head if you can see it. Okay, perfect. All right. So I'll be quiet for a minute so you can go in and, and read the poll. Yeah, I can see one question I've already given you. Hi, Sandra. I think you just joined us. We're doing a poll on some of the stuff I've already talked about with some questions. Yep, I did it. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So right now I only see two people that have participated so far. Oh, we're up to three. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. We still got one person that's lagging, but in case uh, they can't come on, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And I'm going to share the results. Okay, so let me see here. So five out of five on the first one, um, put in uh, answer true. All the above, yes. Obviously, that's something I already talked about. Um, Looks like everybody's answer for question number three, the barriers. Okay, so we have a little bit here. UDL can be used to design instructions for all subjects. Yes, it can. That kind of talks about, um, like what I was saying, that if we have closed caption, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's a hybrid course, whether it's an online course, yes, it's going to benefit all students. It's something that we should be thinking about in all of our courses. Um, Universal design is like, I don't know if anybody's had a student, we've had a couple of students that were in wheelchairs. And when they came into the classroom, they found that the classroom was not conducive to them coming in and being able to pick the location of where they wanted to sit in the classroom. So yes, not only is it an ADA issue, it's also a universal design issue, okay? Um, so, Again, and number five, it's available for everybody. It's going to benefit everybody if something's closed captioned. Another thing that um, comes to my attention, if you have a student that English is their second language, they might be able to read the language better than hear it. So if you have closed captions, you're going to help them out as well. Okay, so kind of keep that in mind. Okay, um, this is something that we're going to get into um, and talk about that really, if, if your course, if your assignments can have some of this diversity and some of the options here of different types of submissions, um, obviously, if it's a general education course that requires that um, writing as a part, they have to show proof of, you know, being able to write properly using proper grammar, sentence structure, but maybe you could throw in a project that they could use a storyboard or a podcast or be able to use voice thread and talk about it and not have to write everything out. So we're giving some students some different options, okay? Um, so yes, this one should be all of the above, okay? 
um, equity and you know, like this one I had to read several times for it to make any sense. But basically, you give everybody all the resources that you possibly can give them to make it so it's the, the equity is that every single student gets everything that they need to be able to succeed in your course, okay? So that one, as you know, as you're looking and I see that, you know, the, the answers were um, going back and forth, but the first one is the correct one where we're giving them all the same resources because we're giving them all the same things to start with. And we've made sure that, um, so for an example, um, you know, if, if there's an image and we have the alt text on it, we can make sure that the student that needs a screen reader can use that same material as the person that can read and look at the screen and be able to read about that topic or that image or whatever. So it's very important to make sure that we meet all these standards when we create our materials. Okay. Now, after doing that, and I know that, you know, because especially those last couple of questions there, does anybody have any questions for me specific about to that survey that I just had you do? Yeah. Now that was a quick, easy survey that I put in as a poll into Zoom. So you can actually, if you're going to do, um, I know Bill, you're doing a, a hybrid. Oh, I think we lost Bill. Um, if you have a hybrid course, or if you have a high flex course, or something like that, where you're trying to get the the people that are on, you know, online and doing the Zoom session involved, you can do a, a poll for them to fill out while you're asking the students in the classroom. And a lot of times the students in the classroom, you could give them you know, the URL to the poll and actually have them answer the questions as well. I know that Lisa uses um, Kahoot for her polling and she can just give them the link to it and then they can do it on their phones or they can do it remotely on their screens as well. So that way she can have the people in the classroom participate at the same time as the people that are um, Zooming. And then some polls that she does, she does them so that um, they're ongoing. So at the end, she releases it maybe in the next class and shows it to everybody, including the students that are online, so they can go back and see the results of those polls. So it's a way to you know get everybody involved, especially if you're in a high flex mode and you're trying to get everybody doing the same thing and participating and engaging and, and working with each other. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind. And Lisa and I have tried to decide to do, um, we're going to try some of the tools that we're going to be talking about um, in each one of our sessions. So um, I did polling today. Lisa's going to do Padlet another day. And then um, I know that she's going to use Kahoot for another one, just so that you get a chance to see these tools and how they can be used. And she's going to do a whole session on um, tools of engagement and talk about each one of these tools and how to use them in the classroom and stuff, okay? So we're introducing that as well. Okay, now, um, one of the things that, again, that we're gonna talk about is even though we're looking at UDL and we're looking at accessibility, we've got to incorporate some of the diversity and inclusion into our um, courses as well. And I know that um, I, at times, will be a little blunt about things and um and you know I try to kid about things sometimes and say you know really you know you didn't know this but um I have to reword my stuff I have to reword my syllabus I have to go back through and this caring for students playbook is a great resource for you to think about the things that you're telling them you know are things required um are we using the word required um like I said in I'll show you that email that I was talking about here. I have this email that I sent out because this particular course requires software that we do not offer free th through our campus. It's not part of Office 365. So I let my students know at the beginning of the semester, and then I let them know again before the course starts. We're not starting until April 6th, and I've already sent this email out to students. So I'm trying to give them a heads up. Um, I have other courses that we do offer free software and we do, um, that I don't require books for. So um, I try, that's why I let them know at the beginning of the semester. So I'm making it more diverse that if my students don't have this, I want them to know ahead of time. 
Okay. Now I was looking at this and um, like first I said, this course does not require a textbook. So they love that. And I might want to accent that a little bit more to let them know. But the second, it's a software class. So they do need um, Microsoft Access. So I put in here, Access is required to complete the projects in this course. So I looked at that and I said, well, required might be a little bit negative. So I could put in there more like um, Access is needed for you to be successful in my course, instead of using the word required and kind of jamming it down their throats. So, you know, something like that. And I, you know, looked at some of my other terminology in here and I was trying to give them options. And it might even help me to list this out as to what the our options are. So I'm trying to make it known to them ahead of time. They need this software. It's not available for free and where to get it access to it. So I'm letting them know ahead of time so that they can succeed based on what they have available to them. Okay. So I want to go in and I want to open up this um, playbook. Okay. And this has some really good recommendations um, on how to word things. And that's where I need help. So um, one of the things that you're going to be doing this week is building your syllabus. So I recommend taking a look at this, especially this first chapter in here and see what recommendations they're making for how you word things. Maybe if you just tweak things so it's not required or negative or anything like that. Um, I, you know, I like, it's just some minor changes that they're recommending. And one of the things that I found in here, they have a lot of student quotes throughout the book. And there was one that really jumped out at me. And um, it basically, let me see if I can find it here. That was page 10. This student said, based on the language and the syllabus, made her choose whether she stayed in the course or not. And I was really worried about this because it made me have to go back and look at my syllabus and it's like, am I being negative? I'm, you know, I'm letting them know one of the things I do allow is I do allow late work, okay? And I know a lot of faculty don't. So a student looking at this might say, well, this professor doesn't allow late work, but maybe somebody else does that teaches this same course. So I might be better off switching to their course instead because they do allow, you know, they do have a little bit of a leeway. Um, some faculty put in their syllabus that they, they will only allow it if you let them know and they can work with you, okay? So at least you're giving them a little bit leeway. I give them four days and after, you know, after the due date and I remind them, I, you know, I give them remind text messages I use constantly. I remind them um, 36 hours before an assignment is due. If they, if they choose to sign up, it's not required, but I give them extra credit for doing it. So, they can actually add a whole point back onto their final grade if they sign up for it. So certain things like that, you know, I let them know. And right in my syllabus, I say, I do allow late work, but I do take points off. And I've had students that I've, you know, kept bugging them and saying, you know, you're giving up 20 points every time you turn in a late assignment. And the students basically said to me, quit bugging me. Um, I can't get to this by the time that it's due. You know, it's like, they're not thinking that, yes, it's due on Monday at midnight and trying to do it Monday night, they can't do it Monday night, but they're not thinking, oh, it's been available for the whole week before. Um, they're not thinking about that. But he was like, I don't care. The 20 points off, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. So make sure that you're including things like that in your syllabus, okay? Are you allowing late work? You know, are you going to work with them if life gets in the way? And we know it's going to get in the way. And Catherine, I'm going to bring up something that we said um, earlier today, you know, how hard that you're working to get your work done and everything that's going on. And um, you made a comment, and I'm, I'm going to say it out loud if you don't mind, um, that I'm working harder than any of my students. And I stopped you at that point and I said, well, think about it. I said, you could have students that are going to school full-time 
they're, they have a family life with children at home and they could be working full time. So they could be in the same boat as you and you might not realize it. And that's another thing that we can build into our courses. I try to let my students know what's going on in my life a little bit in that first discussion so that maybe they can start saying, oh, you know, she's trying to go to school at the same time that, you know, and teach full time, you know, part time and work full time and, you know, run a house and, um, you know, taking kids around and stuff like that. At least I don't have kids right now that I have to worry about. But um, if you give them the opportunity to open up, that helps them too. Okay. And it's funny because something as simple as, I mean, obviously you can see here, they actually took the person that gave the quote, got permission to put her picture up there. And um, I thought that was interesting that they have that in different spots in this book. I would read these student voices in here. And, and sometimes it might make you think, oh, you know, just something as simple as giving them a little bit of leeway for late work might help them immensely. Okay. Um, I had a student in my last five week mod that said she totally forgot about the last mod. Could I let her go back in? Now I was able to, because it wasn't at the end of the semester and I didn't have to close out my grades. So I had a little bit leeway that I had an option, but you know, you've got to think about this, that the students um, lives get in the way, just like our lives get in the way as well. So that should be part of your wording in your syllabus. And some of the things that they're giving you as a, an example in this book is wonderful. So, um, you know, kind, you know, kind of hold them. You know, I know that I, I we have some faculty that will let them do, you know, a good chunk of the work in the last couple of weeks of classes. Now, that I don't, I, I, that would be pushing a little bit too far because I think they need some guidance and they need some deadlines to stay on track. But if you had a student that was sick for five weeks, and all of a sudden they had to try to catch up, then you, you know, you need to let them know that you're willing to work with them if, if something comes up. Okay. So keep that in mind, but take a look at this handbook. They've got some um, wording and I, you know, the wording in here is like one word might be difference between what they recommend in here. And, um, you know, be more welcoming, you know, instead of saying, well, I am available for you, you know? Yeah. I'm letting them know I, you know, I am here, but I'm not being as welcoming. And it's so funny because I had a student last week that stopped me in the hallway. And she's like, are you my online instructor for CIS 111? And I said, yes. And she's like, I love how you introduce yourself to the class. And it is something as simple as I put my picture in and not only do I give them information about my background, you know, how many years that I've worked for the college, what I've done, what jobs I've had on, you know, I've worked for 37 years for the college so far. And then I talk a little bit about my family as well. I'm letting them know that, yes, you know, I have a life too. You know, I get up early in the morning and I go to bed early at night. So if you email me at 10 o'clock at night, you're probably not going to get a response until the next day. So, you know, little things like that, you can put into, you know, these, you know, your profile and stuff like that, just to let them know. So they're not panicking and saying, well, I, you know, it's my fault. I waited till 11 o'clock at night to do this assignment. Now I have no help. At least if they know that ahead of time, that they might not have that available to them. So the more open we are, um, the better. Plus, one of the other things I also include is um, a course navigation video. So this way, when they go into my course. That, that's the first thing. I have it in several different places inside the course. I have it in the announcement. I have it in the welcome. And then I have a link again in my profile telling them, watch this. You know, the, this five minute video is going to save you hours of trying to search for something. And I wish I had done that for Catherine she, when she was having a terrible time finding this course. Um, one of the other things, um, one of you had a problem with um, Digo asking you for a credit card. I'm like, oh, this is not right. So we worked it out. And then I added that into my directions for the assignment to make sure that I already knew, do the, the free one so you're not asked for that information. The last thing I want to do is have you pay, pay for something. 
Okay, so, you know, kind of keep that in mind, but this playbook is wonderful. It has some really good ideas of what you should be putting into your syllabus and, you know, letting your students know when they're starting that course. That first welcome and that course information is the most important part of your course. If they get lost or they see a barrier and they can't get into a file or open something, immediately they're put off. So, you know, that's why those beginning documents are so important, okay? So, you know, kind of keep that in mind. All right, so, all right, and then there's the language, which I already showed you in the book. Okay, so inside your courses, you do have help for um, ADA compliance. So I'm gonna go in and I realized I went in here as a student, but, let me just show you something. Right now, you should have completed Mod 1 in the ODL training course. And right now, you're going to be working on Mod 2 in here. Okay. Now, because I'm in here as a student right now, in fact, I think I need to go back a screen for you to see what I saw. See here on the end of this information, if this were a file, the students will see this. And if they click on that, they get different options to download different types of files. So they can get an electronic braille reader. They can get an audio file. So if it's, a, if, the, if it's the syllabus, the students could actually get an MP3 file of the syllabus. It takes a while to create it. But if you had a student that wanted it to be read to them, they could do that. So to give you an idea where this is great universal design, and this is built into your courses. If you have a student that knows that they're going to be stuck in the car, taking their kids to dance and uh, music lessons and all these other things, they aren't going to be able to sit down and read this. But if they could download it as an MP3 file and bring it up on their phone and listen to it while they're in the car, that can save them time. And they've already done some of the work from the course. So keep that in mind. Um, so they could pick something in here and they could download it. Now, if this is a Word file, let me get out of here for a second. <coughs> and I'm going to go into one of my courses. Okay, so I'm going to go into one that is not running yet. Okay, so in my course information, you can see here, here's a Word file and here's my PDF file. I always include Word and PDF of my schedule and syllabus because I don't want to give them a barrier when they get started. So the students can come over here and if they want to, <clears throat> they can download it as a PDF. So if you put a Word file and they could change the format to a PDF and download that file, okay? Um, but they could pick that and then hit download and it will automatically create that downloaded file. So that's an option. Okay. And it just automatically comes down to the bottom of my screen here and I could double click on it and I can open it. Okay. So that's a PDF version. Okay. The other thing, like I said, you could do the, um, Braille or I could do a 3D if I do that one, I don't want to lock up my system because it would take a while for it to create the file. Okay. Now, one of the other things that you'll notice is if you go into any of your courses, right now I'm in here as an instructor. After the files that I have in here, it has this gear. This is the ALI gear in here. And we're paying for, it's actually a Blackboard product. So you will see Blackboard in the PowerPoint and you'll see it in some of the references that we have. And you'll see that these ones here actually say that it's perfect. Okay, so this is a nice dark green. But I see here for this FAQs, it says I have a high score, but I don't have a perfect score. So if I click on this, okay, so it's telling me that there's something on the page that it can recognize it being an issue, but it doesn't have any guidance yet. Okay, if it were a, um, a Word file, and it had a table on it. It would tell me the table 
it would tell me it would actually show me an image of the word file and it would show me um you know where the table was and what i had a problem with and it will actually give you guidance under here it will actually say it's a table it has no headings and it will give you directions on how to take that word file and make that table ada compliant so it will automatically do that okay now this is a, just a page in brightspace and this one here is the same way yeah so this one's at 94 and it, I, I can't see exactly what's wrong with it okay i don't know i might have some examples in here let me look yeah so here's one that has a yellow gear now for me it doesn't matter because this is my file for me to use to grade their homework so you can see here that it's actually hidden from them so i don't care that that's yellow <laughs> but if i click on that it's telling me that i'm only at 52 percent okay so this one was just a document with an image on it so it doesn't like that that image doesn't have alt text on it so I can see here that I can click on what does this mean? And it tells me that this does not have an alternate description. Okay. Then if I um, click on this, it says how to add. It will actually give me an option to look at Office 365, Office 2016, or whatever. And if I click on it, it will tell me exactly what I need to do to edit this image to make it ADA compliant. Okay, so what I would do is instead of me searching on my computer to find this file to fix it, there's a download option here. I would download that file. I would go through the steps to fix it. And then once I fixed it, there's an option here to browse. Now, the advantage of doing this is that when I upload this file with the new fixed one, it will wipe out this file, this original file that had problems. It will wipe that out and it will replace it with the new one. There's an advantage to this. It's gonna make sure that my course, if they ran, we can actually run reports and find out what courses have the most errors and issues with ADA compliance. So um, I could go in and flag somebody and say, oh, you know, every single document in your course has problems. We need to work on this and I'll help you clean it up but if you go in and if you just like there's an option here <laughs> if I just do um change file it keeps the original file in the course in the background and then it adds the new one on top of it so even though that new one might come up with a perfect green gear here that old one's still in the course so if I ran an accessibility check on the whole course it would still have those files in the background, okay? So it's very important to make sure that you use the gear, you can download the file from there, fix it and upload it right back in here and it's gonna wipe out that original file so it won't be held against you, okay? Like I said, a lot of people have been asking me about this. If it's a file that's in there for you and your purpose is only and students don't see it, then it doesn't matter if it's ADA compliant. It's only for the students that it has to be ADA compliant. Okay, so um, keep that in mind. So those are the options. So we have alt text for students, so they can pick and choose a couple different text options to download and create files from. They can do the MP3 file. They can change a Word file to a PDF if they need to. Um, we've tried to let our students know. Um, we need to remind them about that. And then you need to check your gears. Any files that you're offering to your students, make sure the gears are at least green. If you can get them to perfect, like I have on my, um, my course syllabus, you know, these are saying they're perfect, okay? So that's something you strive for. I'm not gonna worry about this because right now it can't even tell me what the problem is. I'm at 98, that's close enough for me. Okay, but go through your courses and check them out. See if you have any gears that are yellow or red. If they're red, then they're really bad. And usually the, the ones that we see that are in red are usually um, very often PowerPoints. PowerPoints, are we have a terrible problem with PowerPoints and making sure they're ADA compliant. Okay, now 
I'm going to go ahead and go back to the course. Okay, so when you go into the ODL, this one you're not going to have as many assignments to do. You'll have your discussion, and then you have the um, syllabus that you're building. Okay, if anybody needs the master syllabi from Academic Affairs, let me know, and I, I have access to them, and I can send it to you. But um, this module has a lot of information. Um, there's a section in here for UDL, and there's also a section in here for accessibility. So these are two separate tabs. So depending on which tab you're on, you'll have different information as you go down. Okay, so check both of those out. Okay, and then I have a section. There's a lot of resources for both of them. You know, check those out. And then you only have the discussion this week and then the assignment to do your syllabus. Okay. We even have um, example syllabus that you can pull up and you can actually go in and copy and paste pieces from the master syllabus and fill in this one. Um, now, if you grab one of these, these are gonna be ADA compliant until you start adding stuff. As soon as you start adding stuff, you could make it so it's not ADA compliant anymore. So if you're in Microsoft Word, let me just grab one of these. Hour. Okay, so where it says, you know, put the official course description here, you can copy and paste it right from the master syllabus, you know, what are the student learning outcomes? One of the first things we check every single time we do a um, Oscar review, when we do a quality review, we pull the master syllabi and we make sure that that's what you have in your syllabus. You have to have the student learning outcomes from the master syllabus in your course, okay? So it's very important to make sure that you're pulling those from the master syllabus and those are how you're evaluating your students. Um, another thing that we have in here, we have, you know, a little description on how you might break down your course, you know, describing, you know, are you doing it by quizzes, discussions, whatever. Um, your letter grades should be in there. What is it equal to when they get done with the class? You know, what, what is your grading scale is very important. And this is a basic one, so it doesn't have like, um, the, the online one will tell you um, what an online course means and you can edit it. You don't have to worry about what's the verbiage, okay? You can just keep what's in there. You can make a few adjustments. Um, you can see there's information in here about late work. So you can, put your own information in there. So it's, it kind of has placeholders to make it easy for you. But when you're all done and you put all your information in here and you're ready to upload it to your course, if you go to file in here, there's an option to check for issues and there's a check accessibility. So when you go into check accessibility, it will give you a breakdown on the right-hand side. It's kind of like what you saw in um, Ally when we clicked on one of the gears. And it will go through and it will show you all the issues. Like you can see, I'm giving you one that, that's ADA compliant to begin with. But as soon as you start adding stuff to it, um, it could, you know, mess things up. Okay. Here's that URL. The URL tells them exactly where it's taking them when they click on it. It's taking them right to the college bookstore. Um, here's a page about using Zoom as a resource in the course. Okay. So anything like this one here. Um, you're going to get rid of this. You're going to, this is text that's there for you. It's not there for them. So it doesn't matter if the URL should be. It should be 80, 80 compliant. We might need to clean that up a little bit. And don't forget about the academic affairs requirements. They have, um, I've given you a link to this. And all you have to do is copy and paste these from this document. And why is it not going to... Let me see if I can. Yeah, I was going to say that, that I tried to do that yesterday and it, would, it kept popping up that we needed to reinstall a driver or something. Ah, OK. So Google Drive must have changed something again. So that's why you never expect everything to work. You should check out every single link and in, in your courses. I've had people that checked everything and then a month later, three weeks into the course, certain things stop working. 
but I will fix that and make sure, but there is a document here. And I've worked with Fabio and all the different departments and we've done an update. The last time we did an update of all this stuff was back on June of 2022, okay? So um, all you, like I said, all you have to do is take everything from accessibility on down and copy and paste it and put it at the bottom of your syllabus, okay? So this gives them um, information about accessibility, computer usage, where do they go to find, you know, computer labs on the campus, information about getting help with Brightspace, um, the academic integrity information, Starfish, um, ACE to get help for tutoring and stuff, the wellness center. Um, right now, I've, I've been pushing them. It's like, do we really need this? And they keep telling me it needs to stay on there, but it could change. But I want you to keep an eye on this. And, you know, and you might even want to mark this when you when the link does work. In fact, let me share the link with you right now. So you have it. And I'll put it in the chat. Okay. So you might be able to try that and see if that takes you to this document. If it doesn't, let me know and then we'll figure something out. Yeah, they keep changing the um, oh uh, privileges and stuff in Google recently. So sometimes it blocks you. All right, I see somebody went in. Joe, did you go in? Okay. Yes, I did. They let me go in and I'm downloading it right now. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, just, just copy and paste it right into your um, syllabus. But this is another thing that I look for whenever we do reviews and everything. So you don't even have to think about it. And we're trying to keep it up to date. And I will double check with Fabio before um, fall starts again to see if there's any new updates that we need to, to work on. So that's why I did put the, the date in there. So you know when, when the changes were made. Okay. Yep. I, I don't see anything in my chat. So when I click on chat, there's nothing. So I don't see the link. Okay, that's weird. Okay. Um I will email it to you. So you have the link. Okay. I don't know why okay. it didn't. Okay. Anything in my chat. Okay. That is weird. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. So um at this point we've talked about the gears. Um what to you know what the symbols are available oh donna you, you direct message me that's why oh did i i think it's because i sent you a direct message earlier ah okay I let me um so sorry everybody that's okay now i can't get back to the chat because something's covering it up okay let me go back i think i got it for you okay me... here let me oh that's you already put it in thank you yeah. Joe. okay i got it too thank you there we go Okay, yeah, gotta be careful of that. It's like using the reply all when you need to or not when you don't want to. <laughs> okay, so at this point, you wanna review the resources. And like I said, there's a lot of resources. That's why, you know, you only have the discussion this week and you have the um, working on your syllabus, okay? Now, obviously in your syllabus, when you get to the part where you're breaking down how you're grading students, that's probably going to change between now and the time that you're actually teaching this as an online course. Um, a lot of people will say, well, I have 10% in my face-to-face -face course that's um, attendance. Well, you don't have attendance in an online course. So you might have to flip that over and put that 10% somewhere else into your, your breakdown. Okay. Um, I know some of you are doing high flex, so you got to figure out, you know, are you going to include attendance as part of that? You know, how are you going to take attendance in an online part of the course? Normally in online, it's based on them completing the weekly work. So um, they get the grades for the assignment. So there really isn't anything that they'd be graded on for attendance. Okay. But you've, you know, depending on what modality that you're using is going to make, you know, a difference in how you break that down. Okay, but you know, right now we want to make sure that one, you can create an ADA compliant um, syllabus, start thinking about your wording, especially when you get into stuff about late assignments and stuff like that. Um, you know, are you giving, you know, are you being, are you treating them like 
human beings that have lives outside of class and, you know, letting them know that you understand. Okay. So make sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion is part of that. Okay. Um, so we are at the end of our time, but if anybody has any questions, let me know. No. Okay. The two on uh, video, I can see them shaking their heads. No, but I think we, we hit right at the right time. We're, we're finished on time. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop recording.